Greetings and welcome to uh, our celebration of the 35th anniversary of the arrival of CSNet and therefore the connection to the uh, US internet as it existed at, at that time. We've gathered together a bunch of people who were instrumental in the uh, connection and the evolution of networks in, in Asia and in the, and the rest of the world, well, at least the United States. Um, I will briefly introduce people. Uh, we have, um, in the order that they'll be talking, we have Vin Cerf, who's Chief of Internet Evangelist and Vice President at Google, and one, one of the fathers of the internet. We have Larry Lamweber, who's Professor Emeritus at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, Wisconsin. We have uh, uh, Hide, uh, Takuda, who's president of the National Institute of Information and Communication Technology of Japan and professor emeritus at Keio University. We have Jun Murai, who's uh, co-director of the Cyber Civilization Research Center at Keio and prof distinguished professor at Keio University. We have um, Professor Iso, who will be who is a key player, uh, initial player in getting things together in Japan, um, who uh, is, was the first dean of the uh, SFC campus, very instrumental in, in developing uh, technology in Japan. We have Laura Breeden, who was uh, now board chair of the National Digital Inclusion Alliance and was, uh, part of the CIC, uh, I will talk about that. Rick Adrian, who's Professor Emeritus at Am UMass Amherst, uh, and, who, and Professor Chan, who's Professor Emeritus at KAIST in Korea, and uh, Professor Oka Lee, who's Professor the Department of Computer Education at Ch Chung Buk, I mispronounced that probably, National University in Korea. Have I missed anybody? I don't think so. Uh, with that, I'm Dave Farber, who's uh, also uh, co-director of the Cyber Civilization Research Center and distinguished professor at Keio University. With that, we will start with uh, an introductory set of comments by Vint Cerf. Thank you so much, David, and uh, hello, everyone. Um, this is just such a pleasure to, uh, to celebrate this particular milestone. And the reason is that uh, it marks the beginning of the National Science Foundation's interest in this kind of networking. Uh, I seem to recall the sequence, and Larry Landweber will probably help me uh, get this right, but I seem to believe that Larry talked to Robert Kahn, who was at ARPA, uh, at the time, this would have been in the uh, sort of the late 70s, early 80s in any case, could have been 81, um, about uh, the possibility of getting other parts of the academic community connected to the ARPANET uh, with the other academics who were working at that time on applications of the ARPANET and in, in uh, my case, uh, already working very hard on uh, internet development. And so Bob uh, essentially hooked Larry and me together uh, to talk about, as I'm remembering it anyway, to talk about this CSNet idea. And uh, I suggested to him that maybe this uh, crazy internet uh, protocol suite might be helpful uh, for, uh, for his work. So we prepared a paper that laid out what that could possibly look like. And Larry uh, somehow managed to persuade others that it might be worth following that path. And so the CSNet turned out to incorporate uh, really a, a variety of technology um, uh, leaps ahead. One was to try to get the then popular X25 uh, system to be useful to connect to the internet. Uh, and then there was the multimedia distribution facility, MMDF, that David Crocker worked out with uh, uh, Dave Farber, uh, which was used as a relay system to bring people into this environment uh, if they were not already connected to either the X25 system or the ARPANET. Um, this is all, of course, before the NSFNet backbone was built. 
So I see this as a very important uh, moment in NSF's history. And of course, looking forward at the NSFNet backbone, which was an enormous accomplishment uh, by NSF and had many ramifications later in terms of the commercialization of the network. So the CSNet milestone, in my opinion, is a very, very important one. And those who were really in, uh, instrumental in bringing it into fruition uh, deserve a great deal of credit. And so I'm glad to say that it's uh, timely uh, to celebrate this 35th anniversary. So um, to pick up on Vince's comments, in, back in 1979, I was department chair at Wisconsin and was talking to other department chairs. And we were all envious of departments that were on the ARPANET. And so we organized a meeting in Madison to get together to talk about it. And Bob Kahn very graciously agreed to come as did Ken Curtis from the National Science Foundation. Our, what, our first goal was to try to get additional ARPANET connections for other departments. Uh, our secondary goal was to maybe build a network ourselves if we, that could not be done. And it turned out that uh, being able to add uh, dozens, if not more, computer science departments, the ARPANET was not feasible. And so um, we decided to put together a proposal for something that we called CSNet for Computer Science Network. Um, it's important to note that at the time, everybody understood by 1979 the importance of networking. Um, the ARPANET was really valuable in supporting collaborative research. It was also really valuable in helping departments to recruit faculty and students. So it was really critical to our futures to uh, have a networking capability at our schools. So we um, explored the option of joining the ARPANET. It turned out that was not feasible. And so we communicated with Bob and with Kent and the decision was made to put in a proposal for a network that we called CSNet. Now, the first proposal we wrote did not have the internet in it. It was actually using something called X.25. And uh, it was uh, rather uh, decidedly uh, rejected by the referees for a number of reasons. And uh, we, we hadn't done enough with the architecture. And so later on the next year, we got together another meeting, which was in uh, early, uh, early, early spring of 1980 and uh, invited the same people as before, plus that we had people from industry. I believe um, um, let's see, the person who was CTO of HP came, I think Les Fidesz came from Intel. So we had fairly senior people from industry as well as a really good representation from computer science departments. And that was the meeting that Vint referred to. He came and we talked about it before and he made this really gracious offer that if we devoted, if we decided to adopt TCP IP as the principal protocol for CSNet, then DARPA would cooperate and help us with the project. And given those of us who were working on it, I had been a theoretician before I learned about networking. And so this was really valuable and very important to making the project a success. So we then submitted another proposal, um, which fortunately was funded um, sometime in early 1981. So it took two years from the time that we wrote the first proposal or we had the first meeting till it was funded. And the idea was we were going to connect all computer research departments in academia, industry and uh, government. And uh, NSF gave the project $5 million and that's $5 million in 1981 money, which meant it was 14.3 million in today's money. And uh, Rick Adrian was actually on the inside at NSF and he's gonna talk more about the process. One very interesting fact that I recently discovered uh, was that at the time, unbeknownst to us, there was really high level interest in the, uh, even to the level of the White House in 
our project and that that was an important uh, reason why we were able to succeed because they were very anxious to have a, uh, a project which demonstrated the uh, value in a, uh, in a uh, community that took, made use of the uh, research that had been done on the ARPANET and the internet. So we started in 1981. When we uh, started, there was great interest all over. We had dozens of uh, departments wanting to connect immediately. Um, we also had significant input or requests from international sites. And Dave is gonna talk about that later as will I. But Laura is gonna talk also about the work that she did with industry because industry was really critical to funding the project. She was at the uh, Coordination and Information Center at PBN. And I would say her activities working with industry and membership was absolutely critical to the success of the project. In fact, uh, NSF had decreed that we had to become self-sufficient within three years. Dave will talk a little bit more about that. So I'm gonna now leave stop talking and Dave will talk a bit more about CSNet then I'm going to come back and talk about the international connections and then Dave will talk specifically about the Japan and Korea connections. So Dave, I'll hand the baton to you. Okay. Um, yeah, the CSNet when it got started, uh, as Larry mentioned, one of its key components was the ability to uh, basically transfer mail back and forth between computer science departments in the United States uh, using uh, a relay site that was installed at the University of Delaware, uh, where I was a uh, faculty at that point. The software we used was developed by Dave Crocker, so-called MMDF, uh, which turned out to be a very flexible and and a reliable piece of software, which was critical at this point, because uh, in spite of the fact that at every computer science department, there was a lot of interest in networking. There were also a lot of computer scientists who just didn't quite get networking. And so uh, it had, the service had to be reliable or it would not have launched. The uh, Dave at that point was a graduate student. The majority of the traffic came to us via telephone lines since the uh, X25 capabilities were not widespread. And remember, this is, this is uh, prior to the explosion of, the, of NSFNet and, and things as most schools did not have particularly uh, good connectivity other than by uh, data lines basically over the telephone network. Uh, that led us into an interesting position that uh, we had issues like who pays, right? Uh, telephone, if you remember back then, was actually a fairly expensive commodity, not, not as it is now where you have flat rates and everything works. And so international calls and even domestic calls, depending on the department involved, was a major expense. Uh, we... we um, address that in a number of ways. But let me also talk about uh, something dealing with, in particular, something which has constantly been a problem. Uh, we were running a, 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 a mail relay system, mail and files. That had to be reliable. If it wasn't reliable, it wouldn't work. If, if you lose mail, people will stop using it. If you lose files, people will start you losing it. It had to be secure. You know, basically the, the staff at Delaware in principle could look at everything. That was unacceptable. So in fact, we had to develop a set of rules that govern the way maintenance was done on the computer, backups were done, a whole set of things dealing with the security of, of the people who had to look at problems, but they had to essentially treat everything they see as, as a sacred, secure. So it was an interesting thing uh, to watch that develop. As Larry said, one of the criteria of, 
of the uh, funding was that at the end of three years, we wanted to be self-sufficient. We also had departments where, uh, at schools where even a small amount of money to support the network was quite often a major part of their dis disposable uh, funds. And so uh, we had a fee structure <clears throat> that depended on the size of the department, which ranged something like uh, $1,000 and $500 up to uh, $10,000 for the large universities with all sorts of dis dispensation for people who pleaded that they were broke. We want to get people on because networks are only useful if you have people to talk over it. One of the things that happened um, in a, in a so, somewhat serendipitous way in the early days is that big companies came to, to us and said, um, we, we're having a problem. Problem is very simple. We're, we're hiring graduate students from computer science departments and they're coming to us and asking us do you have access to CSNet? And basically many of these companies said, CS what? And so we had requests from especially the large research labs, IBM, uh, HP, et cetera. How do we get on to this? How, how can we connect so that our, our researchers can talk to the academic research community? And this was perfectly valid use of the network. And so we agreed that they could come on in support of research. Uh, we also wantfully charged them considerably more. Uh, I think if I remember correctly, it was about $25,000 a year for a company like IBM and they were willing to pay. And that really funded uh, a lot of the growth of, for small departments, especially. So the, the um, Oh, and, and there were a couple of uh, <clears throat> sort of things of note. Uh, the NSF had a minor problem, the, the uh, computer portion of the NSF, because they didn't have network access at all. The NSF at that point was not exactly computer literate. Um, remember, this is 35 years, more than 35 years ago. Um, and so, we, through a set of procedures, which I'll not comment on very much, that the University of Delaware bought a couple of small computers and uh, I carried them down to Washington, literally, and installed it in the uh, computer science directorate there so they could communicate with the research community over CSNet. Now, obviously the NSF took off and with that and realize the benefits of that, but it was an interesting, um, interesting little uh, tidbit. Uh, the, where we ended up just roughly is that the CSNet grew uh, within the United States to encompass almost every university in the United States, as well as internationally. And with that, I'm gonna switch over to Larry again. Oh, okay, am I muted? So, um, yeah, so very soon after we, the NSF made the announcement of CSNet, I got letters from uh, Hide Tokuda and Kilnam Chan asking for information and uh, suggesting an interest in connecting. And there were many other letters. Um, I, have a, I have a whole folder of, I never throw anything out. So I have a whole folder of paper letters from people who would like to uh, connect. But because we were so busy with domestic connections, we had to put these on hold. So it really wasn't until about 80, late 83, 84, that we began to consider these connections. Now, fortunately in the interim, Peter Kirstein, who was at University of College London, started a, uh, held a meeting of uh, it, groups that were starting to think about national networks. I think mo most everybody was from Europe. We were there from CSNet. I have a vague recollection that maybe Kilnam was there. Anyway, that was the first meeting where people started to discuss the possibility of connections between companies. 
Uh, Peter decided he didn't want to pursue those meetings, so I took I took them up. And starting in 19, the years uh, are always a blur. And uh, I think starting in 1983, uh, we had one of these international academic net workshops every year. And every year more people came and they were valuable because the people coming were the network pioneers in each company in each country. They were the people building their national networks. And that was very valuable to CSNet because as a result of those meetings, we established the contacts that helped us to uh, put together the plans for additional, uh, additional connections to uh, international sites. Now, there's something very important that uh, I should mention, and that is it was not legal at that point to have traffic from outside the United States enter the ARPANET. And fortunately, uh, we were able, Bob Kahn came forward and agreed that if CSNet sponsored an international organization, it would be okay to do that. There's another point that Dave didn't mention. Bob was very instrumental working with Dave on an acceptable use policy. So the cooperation with Vint, the cooperation with Bob were really absolutely critical to the success of CSNet, both domestically and internationally. So over, over time, um, oh, and I should also mention again this agreement with Bob to allow traffic onto the, onto the ARPANET from outside the US was somewhat revolutionary. It had not been done before, except for people who had joint projects, um, projects that were partially funded by the US Defense Department or Department of Energy. So from 1983 to 1987, we worked with international colleagues and we developed, I have a list, uh, gateways first with BitNet, with the Canadian networks, with European networks, including to the United Kingdom, Sweden, Switzerland, or actually CERN, Norway, and then the subject of this uh, meeting to Japan and Korea. And that, uh, actually the Korea and Japan um, gateways were the first ones to Asia. And it's hard to believe, but that was 35 years ago. Um, so at this point, I'm going to hand it back to Dave to talk about more details um, about those connections to Japan and Korea. I should mention uh, before I get into that, that uh, obviously there were others involved in CSNet besides Larry and myself. There was uh, a number of other schools involved and a number of other people involved, uh, Peter Denning, um, I wasn't prepared to do this one. Tony, Tony Hearn. Tony Hearn. And well, Bill Kern. Bill Kern, well, thank you. Uh, as you can see, we're, we haven't rehearsed the Bud and Jeff fact that much. Uh, I want to talk about the, uh, the Japanese and Korean activity. There was a lot of interest expressed and uh, Larry and I were both going to a meeting in Korea. And I took the opportunity uh, of stopping, both of us took the opportunity of stopping in Japan. Uh, Hide had uh, expressed an interest. I knew Professor Iso uh, from uh, uh, some collaborative work we had done early on. So Larry and I met Professor Iso uh, and we were at that point, to use an American term, Johnny Appleseeds. We had tapes in hand. And basically, we came to visit ISO uh, with this tape, which had the software necessary to communicate with CSNet. Uh, and basically said, we'd love for you to install that on your environments and connect to the United States. Uh, and the rest of the CSNet world. Uh, Professor Iso, who we'll talk a little later in the, uh, in the session on Japan and Korea, uh, basically had two of his students, uh, who was professor at their master's degree level, Jun Murai and Hide Takuda, and basically handled the tape off to them, 
since he was the dean of the school, he, he was not going to be involved in the mechanics of it. And basically, that will be discussed more in uh, the session that he, he and June and others will be involved in. But we then went on to Korea to a meeting that we were eventually going to and did the same thing with, uh, with uh, Gildan. Handed him the tape and said, please join, join us. And rapidly at both places that started triggering the development of, um, in the Japanese world, it started uh, the development of WIDE and, and the others. I should mention, I forgot at the beginning of this thing that this whole uh, video cat, um, webcast, webinar cast is co-sponsored by KO University and the WIDE network, which is the Japanese academic network and others. With that, back to you, Larry. Oh, okay. I just have one one more point to add. The um, internet international academic network shops ended in 1988. In 1990, we held something called INET in Copenhagen, and that was a really important meeting. That was a meeting where the Internet Society was essentially put together. The board was chosen. Uh, it was decided that the INET conferences would be the conference for the Internet Society. And this was uh, done by Vint and Bob as a part for, for a number of reasons, including an in, very much an interest to uh, establishing a formal corporate home for the IETF, which had at that point did not have it. But also, it also provided a home for further international connectivity. And so at the first meeting, and the first meeting, real meeting of the Internet Society was held the following year in Kobe. And uh, Professor Iso, I believe, was very much involved. I think he may have been the uh, chair of the conference. And at that meeting, um, we established uh, lots of important things. One of the most important was George Sadowski's and Randy Bush's workshops for developing countries. And the way I see it, everything is connected to everything. So the International Academic Network workshops and CSNet helped with uh, bringing networking connect connectivity to the US, connections to developed countries. And then as a result of the Internet Society being formed and George's uh, developing countries workshops, there was an incredible um, uh, outreach to developing countries which spread the internet widely in ways that could never have been anticipated without those workshops. So everything flows into everything. And again, I want to thank Vint for having played such an important role in all of this. And uh, now I'll hand it back to you, Dave your role in, a lot, in giving NSF uh, a justification and understanding, motivation for doing the NSF net. And Dave and I and others along the way were involved in proposing something called ScienceNet, which ended up couldn't be used as a name. But in any case, CSNet naturally flowed in the eyes of people at NSF into the NSF net which was built to connect supercomputer centers and essentially the entire US academic community. And so that was another important uh, development. Now at the end of the 80s, with the NSF going, net going strong, CSNet just essentially faded away because uh, universities were, were connecting to regional networks associated with NSFNet. And so, in effect, um, CSNet during the 1980s served its purpose and then just went away. And yeah, to amplify one, one thing there, uh, what we found as in the early days when CSNet was largely devo entirely devoted to the computer science departments, other academic uh, departments within the university heard about this. And they kept coming to the computer science departments and saying, can't we use this to communicate to our research colleagues, say in philosophy and physics and other things. And the, the uh, 
computer science departments were not in the business of running uh, services at universities. And in most, many universities, the relay, the CSNet relay was run by the computer science department, not the IT infrastructure of the university. And so that, that momentum, I think, helped the NSF to realize that there was a much bigger set of people who wanted this capability and evolved into the NSF net and ran and eventually the, the commercial internet. And it was uh, exciting to watch this because it was like a, a bonfire. Once you light it correctly, it blazes and this blaze quite rapidly. And uh, with that, I think we'll, we'll probably take the opportunity now to see how it blazed in, in Asia. 